information as you feel comfortable in sharing with us. And then you can put that in the offering plate as that comes by uh, in just a few moments from now. The other side of that card is a prayer card, and so uh, we take prayer very seriously here. Um, I know Pastor Braden uh, faithfully takes these cards, and he prays over them throughout the week. And so uh, if you're here this morning, uh, and you have a burden, and you uh, just want someone to pray, uh, to pray for you, uh, please use that as a resource. We'd love to partner with you in that. But also, the other side of that is, is if you are praising God over something, God did something amazing this week, he answered a prayer, now we would like to know that too, so we can praise God uh, with you. So that is our Connect card there. Um, I, do, I do apologize, there are no bulletins this morning, and so there are times when I print the bulletin midweek, and then I come to find out on Sunday, it's changed, right? And so I look like the goof, okay? Which is fine, I play that role very well, uh, I'm used to that. But then there are times where you're like, you know what, I'm going to hold off. I'm going to wait until the 11th hour to print them. That way I can catch any of the changes, okay? And so last night I'm waiting till the 11th hour. I go to print the bulletins last night only to find out that my printer at home is out of yellow toner and won't print anything. And so I look like the goof again, right? So there's a common theme here uh, with our bulletins and our handouts, but I do apologize that we don't have anything to hand out this morning. So um, this is the worst way to remember is just auditory, um, but I'm going to ask you uh, to do your best to remember these couple of announcements uh, this morning, and we don't have anything right in front of us, okay? Um, so the first, uh, the first announcement then is this coming up Saturday is our evangelism event at 1 o'clock, and so uh, meet here at the church. Uh, we can have teams that, we, if you're not you know, comfortable going out and walking the streets and whatnot, uh, but you would love to pray for the event, uh, we'll have a prayer team here on campus praying for those that are going out. Um, but if you have any more questions about that or, uh, you know, hey, well, what about this, what about that, uh, Pastor Braden did make it here this morning, and so if you've got questions about Saturday and need some clarification on times and whatnot, uh, please see him before you go this morning. Uh, next week, we have our uh, quarterly business meeting. That's right after church. Um, and all are invited to stay, uh, obviously, for that, to get an update on what we're seeing God do uh, in and through our church, as well as, as, also, as well as talking those famous numbers that everyone enjoys talking about, right? So that is next Sunday. March, or, uh, March 27th, it's a Wednesday, is the launch of our refuge student ministry here on campus uh, at 630, and so be praying for that. Right? Even if you don't have a teenager, you don't know a, a young person, uh, you can be praying for those that will be launching that uh, on the 27th, okay? And coming up is a big weekend for not just our church, right, but every gospel-believing uh, ministry around the world, and that is our Resurrection Sunday that we celebrate uh, the empty tomb and the risen Christ. And so uh, in order to do that, we are going to have a Good Friday service uh, Good Friday is March 29th, and it will be at 7 o'clock here at uh, the campus here. And then, of course, we get to return on the 31st, and we get to celebrate. Right? We get to celebrate the empty tomb. We get to celebrate the risen Jesus and, um, and just praise him for his goodness in that. And so we uh, encourage you to be here, but we also encourage you, this is a time of year where your neighbors, your co-workers, your friends, and your families are going to be probably uh, maybe outside of the Christmas season, uh, they are going to be the most receptive um, to coming to church. And I know uh, that our pastor will be faithful in bringing a very strong um, uh, evangelistic message where he will share the gospel and the hope that we have in our resurrected Savior. So I encourage you to to be about that, be praying about that, be inviting for that, um, and uh, we're gonna we're just gonna stand back and uh, we're gonna watch God do something uh, very very amazing. Uh, I believe that, and I'm praying for that. Okay, let's take our Bibles and turn to Psalm chapter. Uh, get this right, Psalm chapter 50. And if you are willing and able, would you please stand as we read just a few verses out of Psalm chapter 50? We're gonna start in verse 16 and just go right to the end of the chapter. Psalm chapter 50, verse 16. 
But to the wicked, God says, what right do you have to recite my statutes or to take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you are pleased with him and you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free reign for evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and you speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this, then you who forget God, lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To the one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. And may God bless the reading of his word. As our uh, worship team comes up to lead us in worship this morning, I encourage you to find someone, shake their hand, and welcome them to First Baptist. Good morning, my precious church family. I'm so happy you all are here, and the new faces too. Um, Please join us as we sing, This is the Day.
I love your word, and I'm so thankful for your word. You look down from heaven and watch all who live on the earth, and you know our hearts, and you consider everything we do. You created the stars in the heaven that have told for generations, have told people all over the world your gospel message, your plan of salvation from the very beginning. You created the oceans and the waves to go so far and no further. If you can do this, Lord, we can certainly trust you with our lives and with our problems for today, Lord. I'm so thankful you're willing to guide us if we'll only let you. Help us to see where you want us to go, Jesus, this week. Help us to hear you. Help us to know your word so that we'll recognize your voice. We love you, Lord. Amen. Our next song is Seek Ye First, hymn number 42. Sixty-one. Thank you. 
offering. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you want me to keep them standing too? Okay. <laughs> all right. Good morning. Glad to have you all here this morning here at First Baptist Tarpon Springs. We, as Linda just mentioned, we are now entering into this time of worship through the giving of offering. And I want us to hear this word from God's word from Leviticus chapter 6, verses 14. Now this is the law of the tribute offering. The sons of Aaron shall bring it near before Yahweh in front of the altar. Well, we display something similar to that here in this morning. When the tribute offering was given by the Israelites, they brought it forward and gave it to uh, the priests. Now we are kind enough here to bring the plates to you so that you don't have to come up uh, to us to drop it off. But there is a point to this, that there was a actual event in which the tribute was brought before God as an act of worship. And that is what we intend to do here this morning and every morning that we do this. Now, was it the case that every single week an Israelite would come and bring their tribute offering? By no means. They brought it when it was time to bring that offering to the Lord as their heart led them. And so we do the same this morning with humble expectation that the Lord our God will hear our sacrifices through Jesus Christ, the one true sacrifice. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear Father, we are thankful that you have given us your son and that through him we have become your tribute offering. What a blessing that is, that you present us to the Father in thanksgiving. Now, as we present these offerings to you in holy worship, may they be truly accepted through your Son, Jesus Christ. For if our hearts are not pure, even as the psalm we read this morning, it is meaningless, but through pure hearts, which you have given us by your Spirit, we pray that you will accept our thanksgiving offerings and our tribute offerings to you. It's in Christ's holy name we pray these things. Amen. as we sing our doxology. Our text today is the remainder of Acts chapter 19. That was very loud. <laughs> that scared me right there. The remainder of Acts chapter 19, uh, picking up in verse 21. This is the word of the Lord. 
Now after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. After he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great Artemis be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. When they heard this and were filled with rage, they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And when Paul wanted to go into the, into the assembly, the disciples would not let him. Also some of the Asiarchs, who were, his friends, uh, who were friends of his, sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. So then, some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. Some of the crowd concluded it was Alexander, since the Jews had put him forward, and having motioned with his hand, Alexander was intending to make a defense to the assembly. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry arose from all of them, uh, from them all, as they shouted, for about two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. After quieting the crowd, the town clerk said, men of Ephesus, what man is there, after all, who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from heaven? So, since there, these are undeniable facts, you ought to keep calm and to do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. So then, if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session and proconsuls are available. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in the lawful assembly. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's events, since there is no real cause for it. And in this connection, we will be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. After saying this, he dismissed the assembly. And I now dismiss you as the assembly. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord God, uh, we thank you for this time that you have called us to gather um, we cherish greatly uh, the psalms that speak of how it is a joy to be in the house of the Lord. And for us, it is a joy to be here, to be with our family in the Lord Christ, to sing songs, to have that be a sacrifice of worship. And Lord, I pray now that as we are listening to your word, as I bring it, Lord, remove me from the equation. Let it only be your spirit which speaks through me, uh, that it would do a work within each and every one of us according to our need and according to your will. Lord, Father, we pray these things in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. To you be glory and honor forevermore. Amen. I uh, just want to say briefly, um, I, there, I have a stool back here. This is what Aiden uh, nearly died as he was coming up to give the offering message. Um, he nearly tripped on. Uh, I am still recovering from my knee surgery. I can stand for about half an hour easily with uh, no real pain, but... I intend to be up here for slightly longer than half an hour, I think. So I have it here just in case I need to take a seat, but I, I pray you'll forgive me that. Uh, this week, as we finish uh, chapter 19, we can see it and we can view it, and I would encourage you all to view it, as I have viewed it in my many weeks of studying for this, uh, as a second act of uh, Brother Aiden's sermon last week. Uh, that makes sense in the structure of the text. It's now the completion of the book, of, of the chapter. Um, but it's really, these are two stories that are intimately connected. And that isn't always the case, uh, particularly as we are in the book of Acts. Sometimes Paul does one thing, and then in the same city, he does something completely separate. But though he is in the same city, he's in Ephesus this whole time, uh, these are connected. They're intimately connected. Last week, uh, Brother Aiden preached on the book burning as well as the, the miracles that were happening 
in the city of Ephesus. Uh, and that he related to the ban that occurred in the Old Testament when, uh, when the Israelites took a city and they destroyed everything that was pagan. They devoted it all to destruction. And that that was the sign of Christ conquering a city, of God conquering a city. And so here what we saw and what he preached on last week was Christ conquering a city. This week we should look at this story as not the conquering of the city, it's already been conquered, but of the rule of Christ in a city. The rule of Christ in a city. So Christ conquered and now we see Christ reign. So let's just start. Let's start with uh, verse 21. We see uh, that Paul desires to travel to Jerusalem. He wants to go to Jerusalem, uh, and then he wants to eventually go see Rome. This is uh, powerful, and I think important for us to take a moment to see how Paul is always focused on the ministry. He's always focused on the ministry. And if we kind of, from a human perspective, look at last week's message, what do we see? We see powerful miracles. And we see that absolutely incredible things are happening. And from a human perspective, we'd want to take a moment Rest on our laurels, you know, kind of glory in a little bit. You know, this, is, this is pretty cool what's going on. But we see here immediately, Paul is saying, as soon as these things are finished, Paul purposed in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. And after he passed through Macedonia and Achaia, after I've been there, I must also go to Rome. That he is always focused on his ministry to the churches. And here we see not only that he's focused on ministry, but he has a great love for the churches. These are churches that he would have helped to plant, Uh, that he is encouraged, that he would have sent people there. In verse 22, we see that he sends uh, two men. He sends Timothy and Erastus to go and prepare the way, as it were. They would have gone to uh, let the church know, hey, Paul's coming, as well as everybody else that's with us, all the other missionaries. So let's figure out some housing. Let's figure out where they're going to stay. And then also, let's begin collection. Let's let's prepare the collection because Paul's going to gather it up and take it to to, to Jerusalem. We're We're on our way there. So we see Paul's focus there in the ministry and his love for the churches. Very interesting uh, to read 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In relation to this, Paul writes, For this reason I have sent to you, Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. And then uh, later on in verse 19, he says, But I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. Uh, scholars think that it's this moment, this, this time when he's sent Timothy and Erastus ahead into this, into this new area that he's writing 1 Corinthians. So it's very interesting to see how all of these things gather together and that he is desiring to go, to do service, to teach. So those are our first two verses. And now we move into verse 23. And I want to focus here on a couple different things. The first is this line, there occurred no small disturbance. There occurred no small disturbance. This commotion which we read about in the rest of this chapter is rightly called a riot. Okay, This is not a a minor commotion. This is no small disturbance, as it says. It's not a conversation. It's not even a heated argument. Okay, It's most certainly not a mostly peaceful protest. If you guys remember from a couple of years ago. Um, and I'm going to do that thing which I do every single time. I always think when I come up to preach, I can make it without a jacket. I never can. I never can. Oh, dear. I never can. I don't even know why I bring it up. <laughs> I don't even know. I'm like five minutes in, I take the jacket off. It is what it is. This is not a mostly peaceful protest. This is not a, a minor disturbance or a, a, a small commotion. This is a riot. And we learn in the coming verses why it becomes a riot, right? And this is a riot against the rule of Christ, against the reign of Christ through his gospel. I'll cover that a little bit uh, greater. But it boils over into real action. And we'll read even later that it boils over into threats of death and violence. And the other thing I want to focus on here just briefly in verse 23 is this phrase concerning the way. I've talked about this before. Uh, actually, the last time that I preached, I think, uh, in the fellowship hall, it, it made mention of the way. And I, it, by God's providence, I get to talk about the way again. I love this phrase, concerning the way. And I love the, the title, Christian. 
because these were both initially used as derogatory slanders and insults against Christians. One, they called us Christians, as in little Christs, to say, hey, your, your Christ, your big Christ, was executed. He was executed by us, by us the Romans, right? That's, that's your guy, that's your big guy, and your little guys of him, that's insulting, right? And then concerning the way, here it's used in a, in a derogatory sense. That it's the way, that it's the, their way of living. But for us, it's not a derogatory sense. For us, it is a, a beautiful thing. These phrases which are initially used as insults towards Christians, we take it as a badge of honor. It's a badge of honor to say, I follow in the way. It's a badge of honor to be known as a little Christ. <laughs> That's the goal, is that not? Is it not the goal of every Christian? To be a little Christ? We should be known as people of the way. There's no higher badge of honor than to follow after Christ. I love uh, the um, imagery of the Bohemian church, their seal. Uh, it has, uh, there's a little lamb and he's holding a little flag. And then around it, and you can just look it up, it's the, it's the, the, the Bohemian church seal. On the top of it, it says, our lamb has conquered. And then on the bottom of it, it says, let us follow him. Our Lord has done all the conquering. He is our good king. Let us follow after him. Let us be people of the way. When, when people come into our life and they slander us and they say, oh, well, you, you, you just follow some book from 2,000 from years ago, 3,000 years ago. A lot of times they don't even know. They don't even know anything about the Bible. We should take that as, yes, yes, I do. And it's good for me that I do. <laughs> it's a blessing for me that I do. And you should too. We should be people of the way. What is meant as a slander, we take, we redeem, and we, we love it. But what this does show, and, and it's important that we understand that this was a first, a first century slander for, for even generations following. There is real contempt and hatred for Christians. We see that in the first century. We see that here. And how this, this boils up into this riot, this hatred for the gospel and for the Christians that preach it. And, and we know that even now. That uh, there are people who would say that they're you know, very extremely tolerant atheists. But, that, but then you tell them one thing about, well, maybe, maybe the old ways of doing things were maybe better. And they'll kill you as soon as they find a gun. Right? There's real contempt. Contempt and hatred for the people of God. Because... We are people of God. That church which has no uh, people acting against it, which has no controversies of people saying, well, I, I think maybe you're, you're slightly too traditional. That, uh, any church which is not offensive at all is no church you should want to be a part of. Because this text is divisive. It's offensive. It harms us in our fleshly state. Let us be known as people of the way. Verse 24, now we're introduced to kind of the villain of the piece, as it were. Or, I mean, he's really just a, a stand-in for the actual villain. Right? He's, he's an avatar of the villain, as it were. We're introduced to Demetrius. Demetrius, who is described as a silversmith, and this uh, occupation is very general. <laughs> we don't really know exactly what he did. But we know he made silver shrines of Artemis. Silver shrines of Artemis. And now even this description of silver shrines of Artemis doesn't, that's very general. We don't really know. He could have worked in the actual temple and worked on the very large shrines, which were predominantly made of silver. Uh, Artemis being the uh, sister of, of uh, the god of the sun. And so she was revered as the goddess of the moon. And so silver was used for her worship whereas gold was used for, 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 uh, for Apollo as the god of the sun. So we have those differences. But Demetrius could have also made uh, many other things. 
a very common practice in the city of Ephesus was holding a uh, a small, very small thing that you would either wear as a necklace or um, you would you would wear it on on your on, as a bracelet or you would keep it in your pocket or something in a, in a bag. And that was meant to bless you. It was made out of silver and it was dedicated to Artemis. It would have been sanctified and prayed over by her priestesses uh, in her temple. So we don't really know exactly what Demetrius did. We just know he worked with silver and he did it in immediate relation to the temple. He made silver shrines of Artemis. And it was bringing no little business. So he's a pagan silversmith, and he's a very important member of his community. He brought no little business to the craftsmen. So these would have these men would have been considered almost priestly figures because they would have built holy relics and holy icons, as it were. So he's a very important man. I have uh, in my notes, he's large and in charge. Right? And his entire life was at least nominally devoted to Artemis. Now, whether or not he like actually believed in Artemis, you know, we don't really know. I find the Greek and Roman religions to be actually the laziest because their whole religion is based on Mount Olympus, which is not that far away from all their cities. They could have just climbed up it. It's like if I said our religious center is Tampa, and that's where all of our gods hang out, and we just didn't go there. Like that, it's kind of, it's kind of what. So this guy was at least nominally extremely devoted to Artemis. In verse 25, we see what Demetrius does. He gathers together the workmen of similar trades. And I like where it says similar trades because this isn't just referring to silversmiths and, and jewelers, right? If we read this, you know, you could, you could twist it and say, if you work with precious metals, you're like anathema. No. It's everyone of similar traits. But all of them related to Artemis and her religious worship. So it doesn't matter what trade it is. They're just working on it. And Ephesus was a major trade city as... Uh, uh, Brother Aiden and uh, Pastor Hotchkiss have, you know, we've mentioned this before. I'm not going to get too deep into the city of Ephesus. Um, I don't find it to be too pertinent. But it's important to say that it is a major trade city, an incredibly important city. And it had a lot of history. There was a lot of pride. That's why the book of Ephesians is one of my favorite books to read, because Paul has to undo a lot of the systemic cultural positions that Ephesians, the, that, that the uh, Ephesian church in the city of Ephesus had. And so not only was it a major trade city, it was also the religious center for the worship of Artemis. So in a sense, in a very real sense, anything connected to the city was connected to Artemis, at least in name. And so we can safely assume that when it says he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades, he gathered a lot of people, a lot of people. There's been, you know, in reading commentaries and preparing, there's... You know, estimates, they say, you know, hundreds or thousands. We have no idea. Those estimates, they don't, they don't really do anything. We don't know. But it was a very large amount of people. And we'll, we'll see the implications of how big it was and how much of a riot this was um, when we get uh, into the later verses. But it's important to know that he brought quite a lot of people. What else do we see when he begins addressing these men? He says, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. This business that we do across all the different trades that we do, it depends on Artemis. This business, our prosperity, it depends on this work that we do. This, again, semi-religious work that they do. You know, these, these men would not have been priests. The Temple of Artemis didn't allow priests. They had priestesses but they would have been considered hierarchy in the, in the city because of their devotion to Artemis. And so what we see here, and even just this one line, that our prosperity depends upon this business, is we see that their wealth was being threatened by Christ's rule through the gospel in the city of Ephesus. Their wealth was under siege, and they had someone to blame. They knew somebody was going to be blind. They were going to find somebody. And we see 
in verse 26, we see that they blame Paul. But before we get there, I want to continue with the next line of verse 26 as we continue our, you know, essentially word by word march through here. You see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia. And this is very important. What we see here, again, I'm happy that most of you were here last week because you heard Aiden, Brother Aiden's very powerful sermon last week where he talks about the ban, the, the conquering of Christ, of the city. That people were converted by the preaching of the gospel and they turned away from their witchcraft. They turned away from their idolatry and they burned all their books and we can assume in that they also tore down whatever personal shrines they would have had. That this happened not only in Ephesus, but throughout a whole region. You see in here that not only in Ephesus is this happening, but in almost all of Asia. What we see here in the city of Ephesus is not meant as a, a colloquial or, or cultural or regional event. But it's meant as a prescription for every city and every area that the gospel enters into. Many, many times people will read things that happen in Scripture and they'll say, okay, well, that was for a certain time in a certain place. We don't, that's, that's a cultural thing. We don't, we don't do that now. What are you talking about? Demetrius is saying it's not only in Ephesus, but it's in all of Asia. And that's putting aside like every other story. <laughs> this is out of the mouth of a pagan that he, he, he proclaims what is true. That the gospel alters everything that it touches. It has to. That's what it does. And now we see who Demetrius blames for this. This Paul, and even there, you see, you can almost, in the scene of your mind, you can almost hear and taste the, the hatred and, and the derision that Demetrius has for Paul. This Paul, this, this guy, has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people. That Paul, in his time there, persuaded and, and turned away a considerable number of people. This language of Paul persuading, I, 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 you know, not to change the text, but to kind of open this, this idea up. It's not like Paul is sitting down and is like, all right, what are your concerns? And he's just marching through it, right? It's, it's not really the image we have of like a classical apologist. But what the, what the meaning here is, I, I believe, is that through his preaching and through his conversations and through his lifestyle, the Holy Spirit works through those things and calls his people. Calls and, in a sense, demands their conversion. And again, this is language of conquering. The Lord Christ, just as He conquers cities, He conquers hearts. And He does this through Paul, through Paul reasoning there, persuading, and a great deal of people were turned away. Uh, again, as I was uh, preparing, I found a wonderful uh, mirror, as it were, to uh, Acts chapter 9 when we read the description of Paul from Ananias, where, uh, if you remember the story, uh, Paul is on the road to Damascus. He's blinded by seeing the Lord Jesus. Uh, he is then given instructions. There is, in Damascus, waiting a man named Ananias, and he, he is one of my people. He will go, go to him, and, and uh, he will be prepared for you. And then we jump cut to Ananias, who then hears a message from God, and Ananias says, well, you know, listen, I don't want to correct you, but I, I, maybe you're late on the news. This guy's like killing your people. And the language which he uses, and, and, he, and he implies that this Paul is doing a great deal of damage to a considerable number of people in Jerusalem. And so here we see this Paul who professionally murdered Christians 
and approved of the stoning of the first martyr, Stephen, has now been saved, has gone through all the stories that we've read of him doing all these different things, and now he's not persecuting a considerable number of people, but he's calling them to repentance. For me, as I was preparing, I found that to be a beautiful thing. That the Lord not only saves us from our wickedness, but then takes whatever zeal we had of wickedness and places it to zeal of Christ. Zeal for His kingdom. Zeal for the gospel. And now we read this line, which is one of the most bizarre lines uh, I, I pray in, in uh, heaven we have some sort of like, you know, uh, we can recreate history. I, w- I want to just be a fly on the wall for this specific line of, of Demetrius' dialogue. The end of uh, verse 26, saying, and this is what Paul is saying, right? He's, he's essentially quoting Paul, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. I mean, that's got to be one of the simplest statements ever, Right? This is equal to a person making a fried egg sandwich for for breakfast and saying, this thing which I just made is a god. Okay? This is the absurdity of this statement. But this was the whole basis of Artemis worship. Is that they would make these gods and these gods actually did something. One of the commentaries that I always love to read uh, is uh, Matthew Henry. Um, great commentary set. Very easy to read if you're ever looking for a good commentary set to read. And he goes on like a diatribe about just how dumb this statement is. But I think what it does for us is it educates us on the veiled vision, on the hardened heart. You have to be truly hardened of heart to say this little coin that I made with Artemis's face on it this coin is going to save me when it starts raining. Which is, is one of the things that they would pray for with this Artemis worship. Because the city of Ephesus in about 400 BC, so about 400 years before the Lord Christ, had been essentially washed away by a huge flood. And so they would pray that this little coin with Artemis's face or the little shrine that they would set up in their house or they would go to the uh, temple of Artemis and they would pray there, hey, don't, don't wash us away. How is this molten image, this shrine, this coin, this little thing, how is this supposed to save you? How is this supposed to control the weather? It can't, obviously, is the answer. But that is how hardened the heart is of the non-believer. That they will say the most unbelievable things and truly believe it to be true. One example would be to say just most preposterously, that everything came from nothing. Okay, this is the argument of the, of the pure materialist, right? That the Big Bang happened and everything happened, but that's it. Like, where did it come from? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. Everything came from nothing. This is obviously not true. And then it, to end this first section of... Demetrius' speech, we have the first half of verse 27. Where he says this, Not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute. We'll pause there. There is danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute. That this trade of ours, this worshipping of Artemis, and all of our livelihoods, not only our prosperity, but the whole industry, will be wiped out because of this. Because of how the gospel, which is being preached by Paul and and these other missionaries, how it is conquering and ruling and reigning. And the people are not doing this anymore. They're turning away from this. Not only the silversmiths would have been affected by this, but the whole of the city. There were Artemis worshippers outside of the city of Ephesus. And they... They would travel on a pilgrimage. And that was a huge industry. A huge industry. And so now we can almost, again, picture ourselves there. He's riling up these people, saying all this inflammatory language, this derogatory language about 
the, the, these people of the way, this Paul, all of these things. And now you can imagine people coming. More and more people are gathering to this guy who's screaming and shouting, right? And now he's saying not only the silversmiths and the tradesmen, but the whole of the city. The whole of the city. And that's where we find this shift in language. Because previously, we've been working off of this framework of Demetrius representing the worshippers of Artemis as craftsmen and as tradesmen, as people whose industry relies on this worship. But we have a change in the middle of verse 27. But also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. That this causes a great zeal to be stirred up. That not only was this a tradesperson issue, but this was an issue as it steals from God's glory. And that this was a, a person issue. That this was their religious spirit and religious devotion. The gospel, by necessity, threatens entirely pagan religions. I mean, every other religion, right? It threatens it. It, it has to. We see uh, Exodus chapter 34, verse 13, or verse 14, rather. For you shall not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. God does not share his glory. In verse 28, now we have a reaction. Again, from not only the, the, the workmen of similar trades, or these craftsmen, but of anyone else who would have gathered in as you know, faithful Artemis worshipers, as it were. Verse 28, when they heard this and were filled with rage, they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Their religious zeal was mixed with a present and practical danger to them. That being that they were going to lose all their stuff because these industries were going to be destroyed. There was great fervor, and here we see the riot begin. This uh, idea of them being filled with rage reminded me of uh, Luke 13, verse 28, where the Lord Jesus describes those who will not be in the place with Abraham and with him as they're gnashing their teeth. They're just so angry. They're seething with rage. We see this great fervor. It's a boiling point, And the riot begins. And this riot leads to the kidnapping of Paul's companions. They take Paul's companions in verse 29. They take Aes and uh, Aristarchus. And they take them to the theater. It would have been a uh, it would have been similar to uh, the Colosseum in, in Rome. It would have been much smaller, obviously. But this was a traditional place of execution. And places like this throughout the Roman Empire were one of the main places where Christians were put to death. Those wonderful Christian martyrs who died in the early centuries were often brought to places just like this to be put to death. And so seeing that, Paul's other companions didn't let him go. Verse 30, And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him. Also some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. Some people may, have, may look at this and on a first reading they would say, well, that's, that's like cowardice, right? He knows that there's going to be persecution. He's, he knows he could be martyred, but he, he doesn't go. He doesn't... He, he, he could have pushed against his friends. He could have said, no, 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 I'm going to go. The Lord would want me to go. But I think on a greater reading, we know that Paul is not a coward. His whole life is a testimony to such a thing. He's not afraid to die. So what would it be? It is that Paul's friends, and eventually I'm sure they would have you know, had a conversation with Paul, and Paul would have realized, 
I shouldn't go there because I have more work to do. Reminds you of Philippians chapter 1. It's better for me that I would leave to be with Christ, but it's better for you that I stay. I have, good, I have work to do. And again, this brings us back to, the verse, to verse 21, that he's purposed in his heart to go to the good ministry, to go to the churches, to do these things. 2 Samuel chapter 18, uh, David is facing a foe, and he essentially gives out an order that he's going to lead, uh, he's going to lead an attack. And in verse 3 he says, But the people said you should not go out, for if we indeed flee, they will not care about us, even if half of us die, they will not care about us. But you are worth 10,000 of us. Therefore now it is better that you be ready to help us from the city. And then 1 Corinthians 15.32, this is one of the places where we see Paul referencing his time in Ephesus. He says this, If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. This phrase, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die, was a common phrase used by, glad by gladiators. And so he's saying, if from human motives he would have gone to the, to the theater, to the Colosseum, to fight wild beasts, which was how many Christians were executed, how many uh, rambunctious gladiators were brought to their death. What is a prophet? It was, it was good. It was good. It's not, we're, we're not condemning Paul for, for being a coward, right? He, he acted prudently. Now in verse 32, we see that this crowd has now boiled over and they're in complete confusion. We know that self-control and by extension discipline, there are virtues, they are spirits of, of God, they are fruits of the Spirit of God. So then some were shouting one thing and some another for the assembly was in confusion and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. But they were whipped up into a religious zeal and it burned within them. Verse 33 and verse 34, we see the Jews put forward Alexander to represent them. They basically say, hey, uh, this Paul guy, not with us. We're cool with you going and killing all of the followers of the way. Just don't also burn down our, our you know, little synagogue. Don't burn, don't kill us. Right? He's not, we're not with him. He's with them. Right? But when they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry arose from them all as they shouted for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. I mean, that is unreal. I can't shout for like ten minutes without losing my voice. These guys shouted for two hours. And again, this highlights and heightens their devotion. To Artemis. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And then in verse 35 uh, through to 41, and there is a, I could go, I mean, you could preach like 15 weeks on, on the, the depth of the history around Ephesus and the religious superstition and all of this. Suffice it to say, they were an incredibly superstitious people. The uh, town clerk, who was kind of like the town notary, as it were, uh, he gathers the men together and he basically calms them down. And as we read it as, as them, as him being calm, as him, you know, calming them down, he's essentially threatening them. <laughs> he's essentially threatening them by saying, hey, in verse 40, for indeed we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's events. There were times where uh, the Jews and, and other people groups who were conquered people of the Roman Empire, when they would riot for no reason, and the Romans just killed all of them. They were super strict. And so the town clerk is saying, hey, even though we're Ephesians and we're a great city of the empire, let's not test the empire here. Because they could just slaughter us all. He also mentions that there are courts, there's proconsuls, the courts are in session. Let's bring charges against these men if we need to, against Paul, whatever it is. But they, they don't. After saying this, the, this, the assembly gets dismissed. This is kind of an kind of interesting story. We see great backlash, right? But what, what do we kind of take away from this? What, what can we take away from this? Every time I read any uh, set of scripture, I try to answer for myself two questions. What do I learn about God from reading this? And what do I learn about man 
not only reading this, but also based off of what I learned about God. And the order in which I answer those doesn't really matter. But what we learn about God is that he is just. He does not suffer pagan idolatry. And when, when I say this word, that God is jealous, we, the human thought is, oh, I'm jealous. That's, isn't that like we're not supposed to be jealous? We're not supposed to be covetous? Brother Aiden talked about that today. God is saying, I'm jealous because I'm the only one that deserves your glory. I'm the only thing that deserves your glory. That little coin you make and put in your pocket that has a picture of Artemis or the little shrine that you have in your home, that doesn't do anything. I am the one that does anything. I'm the one that does everything. That's one of the things that we learn from God. One of the things that we learn about ourselves, not only as people, but as Christians, what do we learn? That Christians are made into new creations. We're told this in the 2 Corinthians chapter 5, of verse 17. For if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. And I like to use the phrase, new creatures. Not only are we a, a new creation, as the earth is a creation, but we are new creatures. We are, in a sense, a new life form. And new life forms, different creatures, act differently. And so Christians act differently. And that's all we see here. That Christ is ruling through the conversion of souls. Through Christ being preached by Paul as Paul is persuading and turning people away. The Holy Spirit is working. He is converting people. He is conquering. So not only is the city of Ephesus, has there been a ban, has there been things which are devoted to destruction, but he has now positively conquered to add to his dominion, to add to his kingdom, that this is Christ's conquest. The word which Paul uses over and over and over, it's Paul's favorite word to describe himself, is doulos in the Greek, which means slave. And one of the most common ways in this era to acquire a slave was through military conquest. To conquer a people, and then those people had a choice. You get to be a slave, a bond servant, you get to be brought into a household and work there, or you get to die. And a lot of people chose to be a slave. And that's the word that Paul uses over and over and over again. And the image which we have to keep in our mind is that we have been conquered. That we are no longer our own. But that we are His. And over and over again, the scriptures speak of us being the possession of Christ. That the church was given to Christ by the Father as His people, as His kingdom of priests, as His possession. Now, we are naturally rebellious creatures. Though we are still a new creature, we still got some of the old creature left. And Paul uses this imagery. We have to put off the old man, kill him, put him to death, and put on the new man. And so what we see here, in a physical sense, we can apply to ourselves as a spiritual reality. That just as Christ conquered the city of Ephesus and now is ruling through the reign of his gospel, now we see Demetrius sneaking in, causing a riot, causing the gnashing of teeth, the seething in anger. And so for us, we can apply this both physically and spiritually. How many people are just like Demetrius? Where we are focused or a part of systems where we act and, and work in a, in a dishonest way maybe. That needs to be done away with. Are we contributing to idolatrous systems? That needs to be done away with. But then spiritually. And for us personally. One of the lessons that we can take away here is that Christ has dominion over all things. 
including our finances. Including our finances. That we must honor Christ with them. And if we are acquiring financial gain through dishonest or immoral or idolatrous ways, do away with it. That's not a suggestion, but a command. That that is what the new creature does. One of my favorite parables of the Lord Christ is the parable of the talents. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. And I can't tell you how many sermons I've heard preached on this, where the preacher talks about spiritual gifts and spiritual skills. Yeah, that, that is something we should talk about with that. But also, like your money too. Because he, liter- he gives them talent. He gives them money. So for us, how are we stewarding our funds? Because they are the Lord's. They are the Lord's. And if we try to say to the Lord Christ, you may have dominion over my conduct in certain areas, but in this area, I'm going to draw a circle and you can have no touch there. He's going to tear down your structures. He's going to tear down your fortifications. Those walls are coming down like Jericho. And then the second thing that we can see is this religious zeal. So not only was Demetrius referencing the financial aspect of these, these Christians, you know, I didn't mind them when they were talking about it's, it's good to love people. But when they come over here and they start tearing down our institutions, that's, I don't like that. But not only was he talking about the financial aspect, but he was talking about the religious aspect. Are we in any ways contributing to pagan religious institutions or structures within our society? This zeal which boils up into a rage and a frothing rage, screaming, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. As I was reading this and as I was preparing, the image which I kept in my mind was uh, every four years, there's a, a terrible thing which happens in, in, uh, in Brazil. It's a terrible thing. Their cities start burning down. It's, it's unreal, really. It's called the World Cup. <laughs> every four years. Whether the, whether the Brazilians win or lose, they burn down like half of their city. It's, un, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Is that, is that devotion religious? Most certainly. I, I remember and I, and I read the story of the woman who was shot in, the, uh, in L.A. Or, or Las Vegas or whatever it was for the Super Bowl celebration. Are you telling me that's not some form of pagan religious zeal? I'm not saying it's pagan for you to watch sports. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. But when it boils over into a lack of self-control, where it becomes everything to you. And listen, I, I like sports. I don't like playing them much since I tore my ACL. But I don't mind watching them. But when it becomes everything to you, it becomes idolatrous. And one of the ways that we know that it is idolatrous is if we look to see, is this where our time, our money, and our efforts are going? If we think more of those things than the things of God, let it be cast away from us. I'm getting close, Pastor. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> Listen, I, I think Ross at the beginning of the year went to like 1 o'clock maybe. That was, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm taking just a little bit of time. I don't get to come up here often. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this. All Scripture is inspired by God, or God breathed, theonoustos and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I pray that I have taught you something. I mean, or maybe you guys are just all such excellent Bible scholars, I haven't actually taught you anything. But what I will do now is attempt to reprove you. 
And to reprove is not correction. Where correction is, hey, I noticed you're doing this. Stop doing that. Reproving is more general. I'm going to try to call you to righteousness. In your life, identify those things which are idols. Find those things which would cause the little Demetrius in you to rise up and stir up a riot and gnash and seethe with anger. Those are the pagan parts of your life. Those things which are anti-God. And I'm not just speaking to you guys. I, I, every preacher preaches a sermon first to himself. And this has been a couple of weeks in the making where I've preached this to myself regularly. And I have already begun taking inventory in the ways that when I first get home or, or, or I first wake up, my initial inclination is to act in X, Y, or Z manner. Where instead, I should focus on the things of God. To make time for that. One of my favorite quotes from Martin Luther is he says, I am so busy, if I don't spend two hours in prayer every morning, there's no way I could possibly do all the things I have to do. How many times do you and do I rob from God the time which is His, the devotion which is His? Psalm chapter 69, verse 9. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on my name. Are we burned up with a zeal for the house of God? A zeal and a devotion and a fiery inferno of love and adoration and service. Because the verses before and after this verse in Psalm 69 speaks then of how, what David does when he is burned up with zeal. He meditates on the law of God. He focuses on his statutes. He acts righteously and justly. John Owen, the great Puritan, said this, Do you mortify? Do you make it your daily work? Be always at it whilst you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin, or it will be killing you. And I don't want to... Uh, Say this as a way to like put it all on you. Right? Sometimes that can be taken that way. But I most, cer most certainly don't mean it that way. Because the work is finished. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When I say to you, take an inventory, it is not that you may earn any blessings, or that you may be good enough. No, because you're not. You're not going to be. You're not going to be perfect. But what we should do is we should be burned up with a zeal as Christ reigns over us. If we say Christ is our king, I mean, you could just not be a Christian and you're like totally fine. But if we say Christ is king, then let him rule. Then let him rule. I want to read one more section of scripture and then I have one last thing to say. And we'll welcome the uh, band up to play. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 8-11. through 11. Paul writes this, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, in Ephesus, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us. He on whom we have set our hope. And he will yet deliver us, you also joining and helping us through your prayers, so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. As we do this, which is the work and the life and the behavior and conduct of the new creature, 
of the conquered person, of the slave to Christ, as we do this, we can trust that we are not alone because we have many brothers who are here and sisters who are here and that Christ will deliver us. We have been conquered. We are conquering. And one day, we will be fully free of sin. Fully a new creature. Glorified unto the name of Christ. Now, it would not be a sermon which was preached or a lesson which was taught by Braden, not without a Charles Spurgeon quote. And I'm sorry, Hodgkins. I, I, I cut so much. I can't cut the Spurgeon quote. He says this. And listen, listen to this. Very important. When Satan cannot get a great sin in, he will let a little one in. Like the thief who goes and finds shutters all coated with iron and bolted inside. At last he sees a little window in a chamber. He cannot get in, so he puts a little boy in, that he may go round and open the back door. So the devil has always his little sins to carry about him, to go and open back doors for him. And we let one in and say, oh, it's only a little one. Yes, but how that little one becomes the ruin of the entire man. Let us go from this place bolstered in our resolve to let sin not live with us. Do not make him your bedfellow, but cast him out. Cast him out. Cut that part of your life out. If it is not an activity which glorifies God, if it, if it, if it is found that as we examine our monies, our time, our effort, all of these things, our thoughts, then let us remove them. For those do not glorify God. Let us pray. And then we'll have the band. Lord God, I pray that you would do a work. We know you will. You are always working for the good of your people. And oftentimes, the working of the Lord to us is painful. But it is painful for a moment. We know that relief comes. We know that holiness comes. We know that the blessings of our Lord come. So, Father, I pray that you would equip us well as you have equipped us in your word. Let us have a zeal for your house. Let us be burned up just as these pagan silversmiths and pagan idolaters of Artemis. Just as they were drawn into so great a fury at the even the inclination or the thought that their goddess was being defamed. Let us have such a, a zeal for the Lord in our lives that we would be devoted. We would love you. We would desire to serve you more because you deserve it. These gods which are made by hands are not gods at all, but you reign. Lord, you reign in our lives. You reign over all of the creation. Father, we pray these things in the name of our King, of our great High Priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, who we know lives within us, dwells within us, causes us to feel the pricks of conscience, and moves us to do your will. Amen. Please stand as we sing Amazing Grace, hymn number 202.
Well, it's good to see you all and uh, be here to just, I want to emphasize what Braden said. And, and we have to look at our own hearts and see that Christ has indeed conquered all and is conquering all. And if he is, if you are a new creation, he has conquered your heart. What are you still holding on to that you must hand over to him? Or are you still hiding behind a bulwark? Uh, trying to fight against him as he invades you, or are you surrendered completely to him? What do you need to hand over to God today? So that would be what I would encourage you to think about. And as we go about our next two weeks, we have a couple big things coming up I want to emphasize. One being next Saturday, we have the our evangelism event. And like, I, like we've mentioned before, if you don't want to go out and walk, I'd ask that you come here and pray, okay? Come here and pray. We've talked about how much prayer is so important. And uh, please come and participate with that, with us. Uh, and then we're going to be meeting here Saturday at 1 o'clock. And then uh, the week after, we have a Good Friday service on Good Friday at 7 p.m. And then, of course, Easter Sunday is going to be our normal times, okay? So I encourage you, for that Good Friday time and for that Easter service, please invite people. Bring your friends. Uh, bring everybody that you can. Uh, let's get this word out, of, out here uh, that we are here and that we are celebrating Resurrection Sunday. Uh, there are invite cards in the back. I encourage you to grab some so you can hand them out wherever you go, the supermarket, gas pump, anything like that. Hand those out. Get those out there. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. Amen. You are dismissed. Amen.